going to introduce the panel members now, and if they could please come up and choose their colour chair. Firstly, the Minister, the Honourable Susan Close, thank you. Barbara Barker, our Research Officer, Anne Bliss, the Executive Director, Federation of Catholic School Parent Communities, and a parent as well. Mr Kelvin Grivel, um, Principal of Encounter Lutheran College down uh, on the south coast, and Mr Tony Harrison, Chief Executive Department for Educa Education and Child Development. I'm going to move from the lectern over here. Turn that on. Everybody can hear me. Welcome to the panel. So we're going to start um, by asking each of you, in your different roles, what are two key things that you, that you do to promote parent involvement in education? And Minister, I'll start from your end and work down um, microphones. So we'll just share the microphones um, between us. And we'll kick off the panel discussion that way and then branch out. Okay, well, uh, a minister's job is a sort of strange one. Um, I have the capacity to ask the department to do things. So having events like this and then planning for bigger and better in subsequent years is, is one of the things uh, that I contribute to in terms of assisting in parental engagement. The other, uh, one of the other parts of the job is that I am, as I mentioned, occasionally given a microphone and it matters what I say. Um, you know, I can choose to just talk in bureaucratic, uh, language that doesn't mean anything or I can try to say something that I really care about and that might mean something to the people listening. And uh, you know, Jessica, you, you and I can have a chat about how that goes in the media sometimes where it's really difficult for us to be too human and we're kind of, it's easier if we're robots, but I make a really big effort to try to say what I mean. And so when I'm talking about education, I want to be able to say useful and interesting things about parent engagement. And the more I get from all of you about what I should be saying and using the platform that I'm given, then the better what I say will be and, and the more useful it will be. Thanks, Minister. Anne. Thanks, Jessica. Um, being involved in a parent organisation provides us with the opportunity to speak for, as parents to parents. So offer a peer support to other families about uh, their role in their children's life and in their children's care, in their children's development and in their children's learning. So one of the key roles that, uh, that I would play is to uh, re-empower parents is, is the language I often use. So reminding parents about the significance of their home um, role and their family role in supporting their children's learning. And in that, um, providing uh, resources and information to build their capacity to be actively engaged in their children's learning. Um, obviously, through our um, liaison or, or direct link in working within a sector, working within Catholic education sector, we have a great relationship um, with uh, Catholic schools. And so we also do a lot of work in building the capacity of educators and teachers to work in meaningful partnership with families. Because this is something that is everybody's business. So uh, for families, we need to be re-empowered, to be reminded about the important role we play in our children's lives and to have the capacity to do that. But as educators, um, uh, we need to encourage a, a, a greater understanding of that role and how in the schooling context we can support families to be more deeply engaged in children's learning. So we get the best of both worlds in yes, our role. Yes, you do. And Kelvin, for a principal's point of view? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that surprises me is when at a prospective parent interview, often I'm asked the question, are we allowed to be involved? And I always find that strange because I'd, I'd think of uh, nothing worse than a school where we weren't. Um, openly inviting parents to be engaged. So I think the very the very first thing I try to do is to invite parents to be part of the conversation, part of their child's education on whatever front that might be. And as it's already been discussed to, to some degree, what that looks like for you as a parent is going to look very different to another family, but I think to be engaged in some way is really critical. The second thing I try to do is to simply create a culture where the partnership between school and home is a really strong one. Uh, throughout my full-time classroom, teaching career, I, I never had a situation where I had a strong rapport with the family uh, and there was a poor result or a poor outcome for the, for the student. So as a parent, my, my best advice would be to, see, to say, build a wonderful, strong relationship with the teacher uh, and you'll always end up with a great outcome for your, for your own child. 
Kelvin, I noticed on um, your website that I've been looking at in the last few days for the school, one of the things that Encounter is really passionate about, it says, parents and carers should have a clear, a clear window into their child's school. And if you want to be involved, you're welcomed with open arms. And I really love that. I, I really thought that was um, a, a really reassuring thing for parents to hear. It leads me to a question which comes from the floor from Alex Sims from North Adelaide Primary. Alex says, you're talking about parent engagement, but what about local community, um, not the parents' engagement? And for example, being part of the wider community. And I know Encounter really makes an effort to involve people from the community who can help students. And I know I'm slightly going off track, but I think while we're on this path. Can you tell us a little bit about the wider community involvement? So I think it's some, to some degree that involves what many of you know as a LAP program where you can sometimes have volunteers from any walk of life who sometimes it's a return to work program or something like that or people who are semi-retired who need to log their hours to, to uh, get their get their benefits and, and it can be a real, and Victor Harbour, of course, it's uh, God's waiting room as we all know, um, as well as a thriving uh, community for young people. But to engage people in that way can be really useful. One thing, a conversation we we're actually having this morning at Encounter was about how we can connect even more intentionally with community organisations. Being in a, a semi-rural area, I suppose, like the South Coast, community organisations are really what make the world go round. So for us, either as staff or as uh, to encourage our students to be involved, whether it be with Lifeline Meals on Wheels, uh, the local church, uh, sporting clubs, whatever it might be, is really critical just to engender a lot of those attitudes of citizenship, um, which we really do try to impart upon our, our students. Thanks, Kelvin. And Barbara? Um, well, one of the key issues about parent engagement is that it's challenging because we don't have a shared understanding. We don't particularly know well what, what works best in Australia. We know what works well overseas, but not particularly here in this country. And we don't have mechanisms for ongoing um, measure, measure, measuring ongoing impact. So I think in answer to the question, the new project that we're embarking on or have embarked on will promote parent engagement in education by um, using the best available evidence to facilitate a shared understanding, um, building and sharing information about what works to strengthen parent engagement, and contributing to a shared measurement application to um, enable the ongoing assessment of impact and effectiveness of parent engagement policies and strategies. I sound a bit like a politician, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> You're doing it well. Tony, can you tell us about how, what you would do to promote parent involvement, and you've just You've got a daughter who's just finished, or she's at uni now, isn't she? So you're both sides of the, mm. you're seeing it from both sides. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jess. If I could start by saying that um, I guess I might have a different perspective in relation to this from a chief executive's perspective, and I guess I need to look at it from a whole system perspective, the public education system. Um, but can I really start by saying that it's important to remind ourselves of the complexity of this environment that we're operating in. And uh, I guess I mean that if I look at it from the public system as well as the Catholic and the independent system, the public system has around about 165 to 170,000 students and the Catholic and independent system, I hope I'm right in saying, has about 95,000 students. So in South Australia any given year we have around about 250 or 260,000 students. If you multiply the aspect of how many parents, support workers and carers are involved, and if you think of the uniqueness of the service delivery model that we're involved in collectively over some 13, 14 years, often the life of a child and the relationship with the parents, I'd suggest there's no other service delivery model that can actually replicate the complexities and the unusual aspect of the relationship that we have with children, parents and the broader communities. So I do bring, I guess, the perspective of thinking about it from a customer service perspective. I think it's actually more than just the educator, the child and their family. I actually think it is more important as well for us to consider that we transact, and I, I use the word deliberately but somewhat provocatively, that we transact as a system every day, every week, every term, year after year after year with children and their families. And I always try and remind myself about the importance of that relationship and how we actually embark on engagement from that perspective. because. I think it's far more complex than just transacting with a government department or a, an industry or a sector, whatever it might be, because of the uniqueness of the relationship that we have with children and parents. Certainly internally within the uh, public system, um, we've done a lot in the last couple of years to better define and identify 
the importance of the relationship between individual schools, their children, parents and their local communities, and that of the public education system. And I really do echo the words of the Minister earlier on that I think, fortunately in South Australia, I have a great relationship with my colleagues, um, certainly one that's in the room today, I'm not sure about Helen, um, uh, certainly one that's in the room, that we are in a unique situation that we can consider education and the relationship between school sites and parents from a South Australian perspective. And we do meet on a very regular basis and we often consider these sorts of issues from a South Australian education perspective, not only from an individual sector perspective. So we're in a really nice position, I guess, is mm. to look at it from that South Australian perspective as well. Mm. I want to talk about homework um, briefly. I don't know, it just sends our blood pressure up. I can just feel it. Um, what, are, what are the views on homework? How much should we be doing in primary schools? And I guess how can parents best get involved? And I'm going to ask you about it first and then perhaps Kelvin. Um, I was sharing earlier that one of my um, worst parenting experiences was supervising homework. So I come from a perspective of what I know doesn't work. Um, <laughs> What I'd say is that um, homework needs to be meaningful, purposeful and relevant and engaging for our young people. And if we can focus on homework as supporting the capacities we want our young children to develop and our children and, and young people to develop, um, rather than the content or filling in a worksheet or completing a, an, a, um, you know, a ticker box uh, activity, then it's going to be meaningful purpose and engaging. So being able to build the capacity of our young people to learn time management, prioritisation, uh, focusing on habits of excellence that support their learning, like work completion, getting things done on time, etc. That's the engagement of families in that side of homework is really crucial and, and sharing those messages with our young children. Um, I'm a, a strong advocate for homework um, encouraging interaction with families. So homework activities that are inviting an engagement with that child's family are just wonderful. You know, go home and talk about uh, the events that um, happened today and uh, we'll share tomorrow the, your, pers your family's perspectives or, or whatever. And it can happen from reception through to senior secondary, those kind of interactive, I call them interactive homework activities. Um, the other message I'd give families is, um, is don't do the homework for your child, but support them mm -hmm. in those skills that enables them to do it. Um, we're not doing our children any favour by colouring in the, um, the, ho the homework activity or helping to build that volcano or whatever. Um, <laughs> because, you know, one of the other messages we get is when my child's in secondary school, I don't know physics, I don't know maths. It actually doesn't matter that you don't know physics or don't know maths. It's the homework environment that you're setting up as a family that's m most of all important. Thanks, Anne. It's interesting, the idea of making the volcano. Some, I, I hate to think of how many A's or B's we've given parents over the years. <laughs> I think I'd echo what Anne said in terms of um, not so much being about the task but about engagement uh, and immersion in the conversation and, and something Barbara said as well about just engaging the kids in a conversation. You yourself would know how much value there is in a, on a family holiday or a road trip and the sort of learning that comes from that and if you can view homework uh, in some way on that same level, I think that's going to be really useful. If I had to point my finger at one thing though, I'd just simply say reading. We were talking about this before at the table. Um, Mem Fox is someone we all know and, and a great book that she published some time ago now spoke about the value of reading before school and then through school, whether it be reading themselves or being read to for years and years and years and years. And the Minister said herself that she herself still does that with her children who are getting older and that would be one of the greatest things I could advocate in terms of homework. You notice a real difference between um, families that uh, put a, a strong focus on it and families that don't? Yeah, concerningly high, in fact. Um, my, one of my children's in reception this year and seeing and my wife's a teacher, so she, she and I uh, read and read and read and did nothing else really apart from making sure we read to our, our kids. But the difference between all of the children who fit into that category and those children who have barely seen a book when they arrive at school is, is really worrying. And again, it's something I shared at the table was that if, if, if only students arrived at school having been read to, uh, the role of a teacher and the learning journey of the child would be so much more, more productive and, and have a, probably a great deal more hope. So absolutely. Mm. It's an issue, homework, that really gets many of us um, pretty heated sometimes. I mean, I hear people that I work with saying, 
you know, they're, they're sending too much home and I know the busier we get and I don't want to bang on too much about the challenges of, you know, being working parents, but it relates to so many of us. And finding that balance, I guess, between being able to have a wonderful experience, as Anne said, I haven't had too many wonderful ones yet. I'm the one that finishes the child's homework just to tick the box. But after leaving here today, I can see that that's really not what I'm meant to be doing. So thank you, I've, I've taken something from it. So traditionally, working parents have been engaged in their child's learning by perhaps being on the governing council or going along to peach, parent-teacher interviews at night time. As we become more time poor, how can working parents be engaged in their, in their children's learning? Um, and I'm going to start with you again, and then I think we'll try and hear from everybody on this one. Picking up on the points Barbara was making about two elements of parent engagement, so what's happening in the home and then the family school partnership. Um, the most significantly effective way families can engage in their children's learning is by what they're doing and saying at home about learning, about school, um, the aspirations they have for their child and how they're expressing those aspirations, their high expectations for their children. So um, those who work with me have heard me say this often, that when families are supporting their children to be at school every day on time with having had a good night's sleep, a healthy breakfast, um, having been supported to complete or um, attack their homework tasks, are deeply engaged in their children's learning and they don't have to walk through the school gates to be expressing that. That dimension of engagement where families are actively engaged in the school community is great. So for the busy parent, I'd be suggesting recognise what you are doing and saying at home and acknowledge that and celebrate that. But maybe set yourself some goals throughout the year, some non-negotiable goals you set yourself. I will go to parent information night, parent teacher interviews and one community event. N realise what your limitations are but commit to, to something and then all the other amazing work that you're carrying on in the home environment is, is very, very powerful too. Minister, you've got an interesting um, a take on this probably because you're probably have one of the longest days of all of us here and um, your husband does the lion's share of lunch boxes and that kind of thing. But how do you get involved? Uh, yeah, so I'm very fortunate that um, we live in a fairly, what might be considered a traditional household of division of labour except that the gender roles have swapped. So I know nothing about the lunchbox thing. You're so lucky. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky. Okay, so what do I do? Um, I, I read to the kids and I will read until they just say, you are not allowed in my bedroom um, because it is such a special time for us. Um, it means I have a bit of a discipline about leaving functions early if necessary to get home because then I say to people, if I'm home by 8.30, I can read to my kids and they go, oh, go, 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 which is brilliant. Mm. So don't be ashamed to use uh, that you have kids and that it matters that you have a relationship with them. Um, there is the the formal engagement of going to parent night and so on. I've never missed one. So my view is, if I'm not because I'm not there to do the drop off and the pick up, um, and you know the embarrassment of finding out at a at a seminar that I was at where there was a slideshow, I discovered that my kids had something at their school. I didn't know that by going to the school. I discovered it at work because my kid's school was featured. That's how disconnected I am to one, at one degree. So I will always go to those. I will always be talking to the teachers at the parent-teacher night. And Declan often doesn't bother to go because he's seeing them every day. Um, but I, I was also contemplating this, this challenge of what is it that you do know about the study and how do you know that? So the, the curriculum website that ACARA has, which is the Australian curriculum, uh, at the moment is okay to look at. They're now working on making it really parent friendly. And what I'm thinking about is, well, how do we make sure that parents know that so they can find out what it is that the kids are going to learn and what, what the expectation is. And then they might know something about it. But increasingly you don't. As the kids get older, you, you know, my son's already much better at maths than I am, for example. But what you can do is you can get them to teach you. So the, one of the best ways to know if you know something is if you can explain it to somebody else. That's how I discovered I don't understand electricity, because when my son was about five, he said, "What? tell me about this electricity thing. I thought, yep, I know. And then I went to explain it. I thought, actually, I don't know anything about it. So get them to explain to you what they know about a particular subject and just sit there and be an audience for them. So you don't need to know content. What you need is to be interested and to give them a platform to share with you. And as you said, how was your day? Fine. 
<laughs> that's not the kind of what engagement. You but you know, so what do you know about Japanese? Teach me the ten words. You know, how do you count to ten? Get them to tell you is is another mechanism. Thanks, Minister Kelvin. I think I'm, I'm glad the two ladies to my right spoke before me. I thought what I might say wouldn't be very popular because I think um, as much as parents find themselves in varying circumstances, I think there has to be a, a point where you draw a line in the sand and say that there are some non-negotiables. Um, email's a fantastic tool and I know in, in my context more and more teachers are using that. Some teachers are gracious enough to hand over their mobile phone numbers, so Ooh. text can be a great... Um, tool as well, but I wouldn't expect that. I think that's uh, sending text messages at 10 o'clock to your child's teachers, probably pushing the envelope a little bit too much. Yeah. But I think you just want to find that balance between the parent who the teacher arrives in December and has never met, and the parent who loiters around the, around the uh, classroom door all day and needs to be ushered off at uh, quarter to 10. So I certainly think that regardless of your circumstances, I'd really implore all parents to have an active role, whether that's termly, weekly, whether you take a, a some parents some, sometimes will take a three or four days leave and go on the school camp, whatever it might look like. Barbara? You don't have to be a rocket scientist. The evidence shows that just spending time with your children and talking to them, finding out what their passions are and getting them talking, even when they're in high school, that's what matters. Um, We've developed resources for parents and for schools in the, for the ACT work. And so um, we've gone through all the evidence. And, you know, there's things like I talked before about believing in your child's potential, reading together, talking with your child, creating a good homework environment. And what that really means is just making it a good parent-child interaction. If it's stressful, then this needs to be, you know, readdressed. Supporting good relationships, helping your child have good relationships with their peers and with their teachers. Learning about the world together, so things like that. Um, and with your school, supporting two-way communication and getting involved in whatever way works for you, just like Kelvin and the others have spoken mm. about. Thanks, Barbara. Tony, you were one of uh, the state's most senior police officers when your daughter was going through school, probably doing some fairly long and strange hours. How did you manage it? How did you get involved? Um, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. <laughs> um, by, I'm, by I'm happy, and I've got to be careful what I say, because my daughter's ex-principal is in the audience today, and I'm not going <laughs> I'm not going to point that person out, but she is in the audience, so I've got to be careful what I say. Um, I somewhat did abrogate my responsibility on a more purer sense of parent-student engagement, I think, because I didn't do the reading. Um, I was very fortunate that I had a great relationship, I hope I still do, with my wife, and she did all the reading. Um, but importantly, what I did do is uh, I stayed, and I still remain, fortunately, with my 19-year-old daughter, I think, best friends as a parent as well. And uh, for many, many years, I was up at 5 o'clock every morning because she was a passionate, unfortunately, a swimmer, a rower and a kayaker, all three of them. Unlucky. So I got the 5.30 starts for all sports in the morning. Um, but I saw it as an aspect of her being a healthy, happy child so she could be fully engaging when she was in the, that more purest learning environment. And I had great delight and I was very passionate about supporting her in her endeavours from a more well-being perspective as well as an academic perspective because... I think the two have to go innately together, that you need that well-being and healthy, happy child if they're really going to excel and reach their full potential from a more purist academic perspective. And that's probably where I sort of filled the gaps in, that my wife and I had a, a great relationship in the sense is she was more frequently at the school, uh, she was more frequently reading, uh, she was more frequently listening to what happened from a learning perspective during the day. Mm. Um, but I'd like to hope, with the, the benefit of hindsight, that I was certainly there doing a lot more as we worked as a partnership, making sure that she remained a happy, healthy child while she was going to school. Mm, terrific. Um, one of the questions um, that I wanted to ask as well, Anne and Kelvin, perhaps you're the best to address this one. What action can a parent take if they believe their child's needs, whether it's gifted, disability, dyslexia, are not being met and the school doesn't believe it's a problem? It leads me to another question from the floor, which is, Along the same vein, how does a parent engage in their child's learning when their child is struggling with their own engagement in learning? Which I think is a fabulous question. Thank you to the person who asked that. Um, if I could get you two to perhaps help us out with those. Mm, I think firstly, the, the first question, 
I think, in, in, and it probably leads into the second question you just asked from the floor, relates to just the partnership. Um, I had a, a close friend of mine who I went to school with called me a few months ago. His son has severe autism and he said, we're struggling with getting the message across to the school how this can be best managed. His daughter's also at the school, they're both in junior primary, and I said, do you, do you want the kids to stay there? First question. Yes was the answer, and I said, all right, you have to build the partnership then. Because it was sounded from what a few things he was saying was that that partnership or that relationship between school and family was beginning to be damaged. And I said, if you, if you really want your kids to be at this school and you value broadly what the school is offering your kids, please remember the partnership. Because if you burn that bridge, it might be very difficult to to rebuild. So that would be the first thing I would say. Often there are more formal avenues to go down, so for example getting reports from child psychologists to be done or most schools will have a special needs or learning support teacher and they might have their own tools which they can use for an assessment or evaluation that might give some indication um, and sometimes that can be linked. Um, previously as well that's been linked to funding and so a school would be quite keen for that to take place so they can uh, not pigeonhole your child but more so attract some more funding and therefore support for your for your child. But in terms of the second question perhaps um, on another level, I think being able to get in there and active as much as you possibly can simply to understand, not just to understand your child not on the home front but in an educational setting, but also to understand what the school's managing and again comes back to that partnership. Um, it goes to both the rights and responsibilities of the players in this partnership. So first and foremost as a parent, uh, we are our child's most significant advocate. And so we have a, a role to play, rightly to play. Um, the responsibility sign of that coin is how we go about that role, that advocacy role. Similarly, within the schooling context, educators have a responsibility to acknowledge the role of parents as advocates and a right to be able to articulate um, their expertise and their knowledge as educators in that partnership. So that's the first thing I'd say. So in, if I focus from a parent perspective on the role of the parent as advocate, um, it goes to the image we have of parents as advocates. We often talk about parents as demanding, difficult, helicopter, um, rather than saying these parents are advocating and caring loudly for their children. Language is so powerful in the way we describe parents in their advocacy role. But back to the responsibilities element too, as a parent we have a responsibility to know what are the proper processes for raising an issue. As a school, schools have the responsibility to make sure that families know what the processes are. Okay, so there's that two way again. So I'd be encouraging parents in our role, uh, the role we play in advocating loudly, but advocating assertively and appropriately. So follow the processes. Speak loudly, speak assertively, but follow the processes. Because the adversarial approach actually won't work. The partnership approach will. And so we've got to build the capacity of parents to be effective advocates, and we've got to build the capacity of schools to acknowledge the advocacy role of families. Thanks, Anne. Keep, thank you. Keep the microphone. Um, I will get you to answer this next one, and I'm conscious that you need to be on a plane okay. in, I'll, I'll seven in seven minutes. So <laughs> a couple more questions, um, but please don't forget we have a networking session afterwards. So any more questions we can you can ask afterwards. And um, how can we as parents know that our child is being helped to reach their potential, as opposed to just being taught the curriculum that's you know drawn up at the start of the year? Mm. It goes down to the relationship we're encouraged to form with the school as the parent. So in a school community, there's a relationship between the school and the family, so that's that partnership. Um, but in every class uh, context, there's the, the, the relationship between the teacher and the child. And so how we forge that relationship is really powerful. So again, it, it is, you know, this reciprocal partnership means that the school needs to invite and enable parents to actively communicate about their children's progress and about their children's learning and in particular what they know about their child. We have so much to bring to that conversation between parent and teacher. But the parent also is to be encouraged to actively seek out and, and ask questions but also to take up opportunities to be informed about what's happening within the school as well. So, you know, Minister was talking about the soon-to-be-released um, ACARA 
uh, information about the curriculum. So as parents, we're called to access that information and to understand what will be happening at various years le year levels, but then be in constant dialogue with the child's teacher, whether it be by going to the information night and being actively engaged in that conversation, parent-teacher interviews, emails, SMSs, you know, we've picked up on those before. Um, but, you know, I also encourage parents to um, ask educators to describe what differentiation means or what individualisation means. So um, encourage a, a dialogue that invites teachers to share with you their expertise and knowledge about curriculum and about pedagogy. I'm using all the jargon, you know, um, but break, uh, encourage pe uh, teachers to share that with you so that we're deeply engaged in a conversation about learning, about progress and about and then that sets us up for having fierce conversations too. If we're actively talking with our families and our teachers and parents are talking together about the great things and about the school, we're set up for those fierce conversations too. Thanks, Anne. Minister, can we hear from you on that one? Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't want to be overly critical of schools at all because I am incredibly impressed with our school system in, in all of the sectors. Um, but I do think there's more work we can do on explaining to the kids and their parents what the assessment means. You know, you, you get this report back and usually the most useful bit is the, are the words. If you've got a good teacher, the words will be terrific and if you recognise your child, then you know that you're in, in the right place. But what does the A mean? What does the B mean? What, what does it mean uh, for your child to have got a particular result in that plan? How do you put some context around that? How well are they going on the other things that we know matter enormously but we don't report on particularly? You know, how's their critical thinking? How's their problem solving? How well do they work with others? So I think there's a whole lot of work we can do in the school system to better articulate what it is we're trying to teach the children and then how well they're going against that. Uh, so not, not as I say, to be over, overly critical of where we are now, but I think there's a lot more we can do because it's hard to put too much of the, everything back to the parents that they need to understand. You know, we need to make it a lot easier to understand what we're trying to do and what we have done. Mm. Thanks, Minister. That's encouraging to hear. Tony, I wanted to ask you a question um, about uh, the NBN. What steps are being taken now to ensure particularly given we have so many rural and regional and remote people here today, what steps are being taken to ensure rural and remote schools will have guaranteed speed and bandwidth on the new NBN satellite launched earlier this month, regardless of how many other users across Australia subscribe? Uh, well, one thing I won't do is put my credentials on the line and make any promises in this area because it's a, a really volatile, difficult, challenging area. And I have just been with the Minister in the country for the last couple of days and we regularly got the feedback about bandwidth and lack of opportunity to exploit digital education opportunities through these challenges. Uh, I'm carefully optimistic, and I say that um, carefully, because um, it seems like we have satellites being launched, it seems like we have a continuation of MBN being rolled out in some of the more rem remote country rural areas. I'm relatively confident that it's going to continue to improve, but most likely not at the speed that we would all like it to by any means. We've got some real critical um, uh, improvement opportunities afoot at the moment, and one of them is the proposal to introduce NAPLAN online uh, during 2017 and 2018. Um, now, that itself is going to present some incredible challenges, not only for the logistics and the coordination, but also owing to bandwidth and having multiple users trying to complete the NAPLAN testing somewhat simultaneously across our system or systems, but also in the metro and country areas. As a public system also, we're um, quickly advancing a new education management system, which is a holistic departmental-wide system, so we're going to need to ensure that we've got the bandwidth capabilities to exploit all the functionality within that system. And also, in the throes right at the moment of launching a new uh, departmental-wide internet system with greater portal access and engagement with parents too, which we hope to launch by the end of the first or the beginning of the second quarter of 2016. Uh, so we've got multiple projects on the go that rely upon this accessibility and bandwidth. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a glass full type person, so I'm quietly confident we'll continue to see some improvements. Good news, but it thanks, But it is a big issue. Final question um, before we let Anne go. Kelvin, perhaps you could answer this one. One of the common talking points for parents is how we perceive the teacher performance. 
Can you briefly describe to us how the performance of teachers is assessed and is it appropriate to seek feedback from a student's parents? Absolutely. I think uh, in years gone by there was a real stigma attached to teacher assessment. Uh, there was, I remember when I was in one of my teaching pracs, I asked the teacher why he had posters all over his windows uh, facing the corridor and it wasn't for student display purposes, it was so that he could keep the world from looking in to his classroom. And that was often the attitude of, well, I'm, I'm teaching inside my four walls and you can stay away and just trust me. That thankfully uh, has almost vanished, I think. And through a whole range of tools, uh, teachers are now being assessed or offered feedback. So whether it be by observations through line managers, whether it's peer observations, whether it's self-evaluations, whether it's student or a parent feedback. So. I know in our context we're really welcoming and looking to provide the broadest um, array of feedback tools as we can because it's only by that means that you can improve teacher performance and teacher performance has such um, a strong impact on edu educational outcomes. So it's absolutely critical and thankfully, as I said before, the, the attitude is now very much changing. Mm, terrific. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please thank our panel for being so generous with their answers. It was just fabulous to have you know, such a range of sectors represented and I, I've taken so much from it. I, I don't think I was meant to do that today. That wasn't really my job, but that's the bonus of being the MC. Thank you so much again for coming along. Thank you to everybody that's come today. And a huge thank you to the organising committee. Um, could we please thank them because a lot of work has gone into today.